holidays and welcome to the quintessential podcast as we make our way through the month of December. Special thanks to Nick Z, the Dr. Z, who uh, is our tech that puts together uh, these, these productions. And a special shout out to Nick P, who uh, helps edit my work on the uh, Lex All Stars website. Our guest this week, Jerry Byrne, head coach of Harvard, the Byrne methods in the house. Uh, coach, first of all, thank you for your your uh, your quotes, your advice in terms of that December article that I threw together about what these players should be doing in the month of December. I found your I found you to be like so logically oriented and choreographed. It was wonderful how you how man like wh where was that when when I was in college? I could have used that in December. Uh, I think I blacked out there for a minute. I I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I said, but um, you know with you know with age comes some. Wisdom, you know, when you get when you when you're 60, you've made a lot of the mistakes that over time, and you know, you try not to make them. Whether it's you know trying to do too much or holding on too tight, or you know, I think as you get older, you tend to try be more trusting. At least I am. Yeah, this is an interesting time of the year because uh, academically, the student athletes have finals. It's big. This this is like you got crunch time for them. For you, it's like a transitional period. You got recruiting, you got the changing of the seasons. You're, the players are going to be going away for a while. You have the holidays in terms of your family. Uh, it seems like there's a lot going on. Uh, what's it like to be uh, in, in the submarine right now for you? <laughs> you, I think firstly, learning how to be respectful of, of their time. You know, when you're at an elite place, Nobody gets to Harvard on accident. And so they know how to work hard. They, I think their values are, you know, appropriately aligned. And, you know, in this time where we're not allowed to do required work, you know, I think the more nervous coaches are, are, are guys who don't trust that their players are going to be doing, living their values, so to speak. So whether it's, you know, having done the academic work all, all year, you, you're not stressed out about the finals other than that you put pressure on yourself because you want to do well. And I'm, I'm a huge advocate in the mental health benefits of exercise during the winter and obviously exercise when you're trying to be in a top 10 program. So they, they need to organize their day so they're getting outside, that they're getting a sweat, that they're playing basketball or squash or getting on the wall or whatever they're doing for, for 90 minutes a day, it's healthy. It allows them to maintain where they are as a, as an athlete on a, on a top program. And I think it benefits their academic performance. Yeah, no, it, it definitely perks up the mind. The issue I had this time of year in terms of studying was eating. Like, you know, you sit down with a book or sit down to study and generally there's food involved. <laughs> well, you know, I think, you know, our generation probably had way too many like, Hostess cupcakes and you know candy. We try to we try to teach all of our guys to make some progress uh, nutritionally. You know we're you know at this time of year where we're not practicing, we're still you know filling our nutrition station at our locker room as another way to kind of entice guys to come over and get some workouts and get away from from you know sitting behind the desk or being at one of the you know thirteen libraries that at Harvard. And so, you know, we're, we're just trying to kind of trust that the guys are going to continue on the types of decisions that they made from August until the end of November or the middle of, you know, so that as they go into finals, that it's just a, a it's a continuum, even though we're not getting together as a group as much, that's where the trust and confidence in the values that you've imparted onto your team you hope like they are cemented and sticky. So even though as they stress out about finals, that they're still eating well, they're sleeping well, they're hydrating, they're getting mental health breaks, and that they're maintaining their connection to the community, but also that they're maintaining, you know, a connection to the things that are important to them, which, you know, being a good teammate, staying healthy, working out, and, you know, having a lot of pride in in performing in the classroom. Harvard uh, making the NCAA tournament last year for the first time, I believe since 2014. Uh, 
Jerry joining us right now from Boston. I got to ask you, uh, how, how's everyone in your universe? How's Dr. Tracy and, and the three kids doing? Well, my, you know, my wife, you know, moved, finally moved in, in February. So we were apart for almost two and three quarter years. So, you know, Shakespeare said, with, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Um, it seems to have been true. So we're, we're living together in a 900 square foot apartment and in Boston, which is which is great. I love being in the city. I love the sounds and all the good and the bad that goes with being in uh, a major city. And you know, I have three kids who are all spread all over the country doing doing different things. So we're um, we're at that point in our lives as our kids approach being thirty. That you know, we have you know, we have each other. And we have a lot of freedom and independence to travel and and do things together. My wife works at Harvard Medical School and. And uh, Beth Israel, one of the hospitals at Harvard owns. So we're we're all in on the Harvard experience. I saw you posted a picture, I think, from the North End. This has got to be an amazing time of year to go for walks, especially at, uh, during the evening uh, in some of these neighborhoods. Um, my my wife's a walker. I'm I'm not so much of a walker. It doesn't have as much competition as I as I like in, in my life. But my wife is a massive walker. She walks to Beacon Hill and. Back Bay and and the Seaport area and and living in the North End is um, you know crazy energy just because of it's kind of a tourist destination uh, the you know not a lot of not a lot of chains so it's a lot of small businesses Sally Marias bakeries um, pastry shops obviously great Italian so it's just it's just a great energy community and it, you're right it is a walking area we have a, a lab so we you know my wife takes them for a lot of walks i i, I more or less just go to the nearest park and throw the lacrosse ball for them holiday season I, I don't have many lacrosse memories from my time in lindbrook uh just the one one christmas that stands out is when my two older brothers hit all my gifts and you know they took the blindfold off me and there was no gifts and i started crying as a 10 year old but I was pretty fortunate. My dad always had, there was always usually a, a lacrosse stick or a pair of cleats or something under the tree that got me excited. Uh, this time of year though, Jerry, for me meant like ma major training, a major starvation for wrestling. Like this was, this was right in, in the, uh, the eye of the, of the hurricane, so to speak. And Thanksgiving was the final meal. And then Christmas, my, my aunts and uncles always used to like, why can't you eat dinner here? Well, we have a wrestling tournament tomorrow in Porchester and I got to weigh 126 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't have I don't have great food memories from from Christmas. What what do you got from from your time on the island? Um, from the five one six that 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 I can share. You know, listen the, you know, like the the violent nature of snowball fights. Yeah. You know, only a certain age group understands the term skitching. I don't know oh. if you. You know, oh, I, I was major. I lost a bunch of gloves skitching, you know, when they stick to the back pipe. Yeah, we, we lost some good people out there skitching you know, <laughs> on, you know, on Hempstead Turnpike. Um, you know, if, and if you're listening to this and you're less than 30 years old, look up skitching. Yeah, you, know, you could get arrested if you let your kids do that. Um, yeah, throw you know. it. What's that? Skitching, skitching was 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 key to find the icy areas, and and you you, you skitch into some concrete, then it was going to be a rough oh, ending. Skitching, you waited for the oil truck to come by because I could I could see the oil truck had like this metal bar that you could get like five dudes hanging behind an oil truck as it came down your street. So we would skitch. We would go to the the sump. I don't know if people might not know what a sump is, but the water treatment took place in in Levittown, but it had. It had a huge 45 degree angle thing. And that's where we did our sledding in the water treatment uh, sumps of Levittown. So a lot of good, a lot of good memories, obviously watching It's a Wonderful Life. And if you're of a certain age, Channel 9 had the permanent fire, the, the um, fireplace. Do you remember, uh, Quint? It just, yeah. during, during, yeah, perfect. for like yeah. a week, all day. during Christmas, all <laughs> it had a TV. And again, for your kids at home, the TV was about 20 inches wide. And all I've had was a picture of a fireplace with logs burning with Christmas music in the back. That was that was pretty much my my memory of uh, of the holidays. And and then also I got beat up a lot because I was the youngest. And that my both my brothers you know rooted for the the Mets and the Yankees and the the Jets and the Giants. And I recruited I I rooted for whoever they were losing to. So I got beat up a lot. I I, I got a lot of Dolphins and Steelers gear back then. 
my mom grew up in Rockville Center. <clears throat> She's got two brothers. One was a, a Harvard and an MIT grad who ended up working for uh, Chase Manhattan Bank in New York and then developing his own software company. But he lived up in uh, Lloyd Harbor. So we would spend Christmas on, on, the, on the, the north side of the island. So Very that fancy. Was, that, Very that fancy was, up there. That was always, uh, man, I, I, you know, you're driving up. You start in Limbrook and you go through the middle of the island and you get up and there's, there's trees and yards. And they actually, I remember the, 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 back then, like nuts weren't available. Like the only nuts right. that people were peanuts. I remember- We had planters. Always, we had planters. We didn't have fancy nuts. They, they always had, they had pecans and walnuts that you could shell. I was like, wow, this is, this is real living. They got nuts. Well, you guys, they were probably checking the silverware when you guys left. And, <laughs> and you, there was- like when we went to our, any sort of my family members who were a little, we would call them lace curtain Irish. Like we were shanty Irish. And then if you were, if you were like had generational money, money, you were, you were lace curtain Irish. So we had a couple of lace curtain Irish in the family. And we were definitely stealing the candy and the fancy nuts from them in our pockets as we were leaving for the ride home back to Levittown. <laughs> everyone and everyone on the island was under the influence driving back home but, uh, that evening and and there was knock on wood there was never any issues oh my god yeah no there, there, there was a lot of drinking and driving back then that's for sure uh let's turn the page uh i saw a schedule up on your website that that uh, says like a february 4 scrimmage and then a, a game on the 18th at virginia uh is, is that accurate and up to date yep we're um, we, we're going to scrimmage uh, St. John's down in the city. St. John's came up to us last year, and um, we're gonna we're gonna come down and do my oldest brother. We we whenever we went, and we did this when I was at Notre Dame as well. We'd go to one of the five or six firehouses my oldest brother worked in. So we're gonna come down on the third uh, practice in uh, Westchester. And then drive to my brother's fire, one of my brother's firehouses in northern Manhattan. And then we're gonna we're gonna do some career development sightseeing. You know, we've gone to the 9-11 museum and, and done things like that. So we're gonna, and then we're gonna scrimmage uh St. John's on Sunday, the uh fifth. And so um so we're gonna play on the fifth against St. John's, and then Saturday do some career development and sightseeing in Manhattan. Um and then yeah, we play Virginia on uh saturday the 19th oh saturday the 19th yeah and then it, it looks a similar schedule to last year in terms of your non-conference opponents and then the league schedule yeah we the added we had we had vermont and bucknell and i think we were not playing njit and uh ohio state uh dropped us so so we added uh virginia and bucknell and vermont you guys, uh, you know, I was watching some NLL this weekend, and I saw Austin Madronic actually scored a goal, and yes. and uh, he he's your guy. I was like, there's a Harvard guy playing in the indoor league. What is going on? You know, we're gritty, man. You know, like not everybody's wearing a turtleneck and a smoking jacket up here. But, you know, like we're, we're you know we need to dispel some of those myths. You know, so, I know uh, I've covered your hockey. I've covered your hockey team in the Frozen Four, so I I know I know the reality of the, the yeah, Harvard no, student athlete. So we're uh, yeah, so uh, Austin, I think got added. I know, I think he was like a an alternate or a practice squad, and he came in and scored his first goal. And he's just a guy. He's like a tight end. He knows how to get open. He catches everything, and he puts it on cage. So I'm not. I wasn't surprised he's had success. There's a lot of guys in that league like that. Uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, from the time that I played to maybe ten years ago, like the defense in the indoor league has improved dramatically in terms of structure. And fundamental, obviously, they get away with anything they want in terms of cross checking and holding, right. but but the pick play defense is pretty darn good. And from watching the last two weekends, like that league lacks a certain speed dodger component. Like if everyone's relying on two man games, then it's pretty easy to play defense. So somewhere along the line, doesn't someone have to beat their man to put some pressure on the defense? They play, they play so they play so packed in. They basically. They make some decisions around kind of 10 and 12 yard shots that, you know, they, you know, the, the amount of interference that takes place on, and, and you're starting to see it bleed into the, into the field game, like the amount of pushing that. Interference with cutters, you mean? Like just well, denying. Well, interference with cutters, but also like you see some teams that say, I'm going to set a pick on, on your man. 
Oh, yeah, I'm pushing you off there. Yeah. Yeah. The defenseman behind me is shoving me to change the angle. So you're yeah. starting to see some of the physicality that's that's coming from that game. But you know, they, they basically there's not a lot of slide and recovery in that league. They're basically you have to beat your guy. They they create these kind of two, you know, two v two one side of the field, and you're basically face guarding your guy on the other side of the field and making you make a great pass or a great feed. So I, you know, like the, I, I went and spent, when I was at Notre Dame, I went and spent a weekend with uh, John Arlotta and the the swarm. And I, I was impressed by the kind of the film study and some of the, you know, the, the game preparation stuff they're doing. It's, it's, you know, at least on that team it was much more high level than you would think from the outside, but like anything else, the most simple answer is probably the one that's most accurate, which is nothing happens till somebody's capable of running by somebody. But it's really hard to get to the middle and really hard to get underneath. You know, it's, you know, there's no midfield like play. You lose possession. And so there's no, there's no like riding and stuff like that, which I yeah. was surprised Yeah. By. No, exactly. I, I obviously I covered the league in the early 90s and I played in the late 90s. And then so I've been away from it. And so to put it back on the last two weekends, I've been off. It's been really interesting. And, and I came up like there is no end to end chaos like there, the league used to be just just nuts in terms of up and down, like undisciplined, unstructured. But, but that was also because but, there was so much Americans playing them and guys were sweeping, guys. shooting across it's, the body and the oh, ball would bounce. The ball speed. would bounce up off yeah. the backboards and next thing it was a breakaway the other direction. Yeah, the goalies weren't too many pads, but the, let's 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 move on to the, uh, some of your personnel. Uh, I wrote a piece recently about some of the uh, the guys, uh, top players who were snubbed. You've got like a whole team of of potential players, I, I think, who could take a next step and be like real superstar type players. Guys, guys that you know crossed my radar were were Sam King being so productive as a freshman, Miles Bodkiss. Uh, Owen Gaffney kind of turned it on late in the year. I thought you, you, you got a lot of the guys. You played a ton of young guys last year who uh, whose futures are bright. I mean, and Greg Campisi, I think he was what he was he a sophomore last year. Yeah. You know, he made he made the IL top fifty list. Uh, who who do you who do you sense is the core to this team? You know, I think you know because we played so many young guys, it's really kind of democratic, and I don't think we have an alpha I know like there's a mythology around it you know whether whether it's a captain leader or who's bringing everybody along I mean I think there's a mythology around that Americans like simple explanations for why things happen so I, I think you know we're 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 you know pretty democratic in, in that sense you know I think you know somebody you left out beyond the guys that you reference is Andrew Perry is a as good of a midfielder we've had in the country. I think he had four or five goals against when we played Carolina this fall. So you, know, you look at Perry, Gaffney, Botkus, which was our first midfield line last yeah. year of all freshmen. You know, he can play both ways. He can guard people. Uh, Campisi is one of those anomalies. Like he was the defensive player of the year in our Ivy League. And, you know, whether you agree or not, it was a, a seismic year for our league. How does that guy make honorable mention All-American when you're the best defensive player in, in maybe the best league last year. So I felt like Greg was snubbed in that way. Um, you know, but Sam King, you know, those three, uh, Gaffney, uh, Perry, um, Bodkiss, and um, um, and Cam I got King. a Joe Dowling. I got a Lucas Hilsenrath. Yeah, Dowling. And Dowling is really good. Yeah. Um, Hilsenrath. Yeah, all of those guys. I mean, we started three of our first, four of our first five defensemen were were freshmen. So, um, yeah, it's that that's a long list. I, I'm, I got basically losing maybe four players. Correct me if I'm wrong. Austin Madronic, Charlie Ulmer, who was a great leader from Severn, uh, was a senior last year, I believe. Did you lose your faceoff man, Cucurulo? We lost both uh, and Massimiliano Mullen and Kyle Mullen. And Kyle Mullen. Kyle Mullen, Mullen he's he's gonna, that's it. Mullen's going to start for Rutgers this year, so yeah. um, so he has fifth, has fifth year at Rutgers. So you know, uh, you know, Kyle and and Austin were both, you know, they're valuable. I mean, obviously, you know, when, when you lose players, it's easy to look at the the skill that you lose, 
what's hard to quantify is, you know, great leaders. So all of yeah. those guys were really powerful members of our campus community, not just our team community. So, um, you know, that, that, you know, skill you can replace leadership is not, not as easy. Who, who do you turn to? Who, who, who are you going to lean on? Because there seems to be like this, your sophomore class is, is really, really talented. Your incoming freshman class, we'll talk about them in a second. They're, they're, they're going to be stars as well, but like junior and senior wise, who do you lean on for leadership? You know, I think, you know, we, we historically, uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard lacrosse and Harvard football had one captain. We had two last year. I, I, you know, because coming out of the pandemic, I felt like that was, that was important. So we kind of broke tradition. We're back to one captain, uh, Nick Loring. And, but I also, I think having one captain requires collaboration. Like, you know, instead of like, you know, maybe having three or four captains now, a handful of other seniors feel like, oh my God, I can't have an impact. I, I I feel like having one captain almost requires collaboration. So yeah, I think a combination, it's a shared power, shared power structure between all those sophomores who have impact, but also we, you know, Hayden Cheek, Tommy Joyce, Chase Strupp, all guys who played for us last year as juniors, those guys become super important as becoming kind of supporters of Nick Loring and, and what he's trying to do as a leader. So Loring had the big uh, early part of the season, then he got hurt, correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you got on Chase Yeager, White Snake, David Coverdale? Is he coming back? Uh, he's, yes. He's, he, I wish he, you know, I wish the school would, you know, allow him to stay, but, you know, there's no graduate students that, that, that can play at Harvard. And um, so he's, he'll do a, he's here, he's with us this year. And I think he's going to take a fifth year at a top, you know, five program. He's, he's as good of a cover guy. Yeah. And um, I like he's, he's the fittest guy on our team. He's broken every record um, from a conditioning and a strength standpoint in our program. And he's only been here for, you know, 13 months. And, um, you know, I think he's as good as any team in, in the country. Ray Durth as well. You're going to have some strong defensive midfielders. I think that's an area of strength, which, I is, uh, which is pretty rare. There's not many teams that going into a year can lean on that. Uh, in terms of your staff, same same group this year, Coach, or are there some changes? We've, we've kept, you know, the core group together since we got here. Myself, Neil Hutchinson, who's my, uh, uh, my head assistant, Will Corrigan, and Ted Bergman's my volunteer who coaches our goalies and our defense with me. And we have a new director of ops, Mike Terranova, who was the head coach at Chestnut Hill College, which is a Division II program in Philadelphia. So he's our director of ops now, and he's a total rock star. So, yeah, he's, you know, even though it's not like, you know, a sexy hire in that way is that Mike has brought in great professionalism and he's blended right into all the stuff that we're doing. And, you know, he's kind of like the general manager of our program. And um, Lars Kyle, who was our former guy, left to go uh, do some different things. And, and Mike's been a great addition. I watched a bunch of your games last year with that drone shot you guys incorporated and it really made it fun and interesting. Uh, what was it, the BU game or no, right. you played the BU game at home? Yes, uh, with that, that incredible crowd you had last year. That yeah. was that, that was one of the top ten games from the regular season that I watched. Uh, from honestly, from February into to the tournament, that was a great game. That was the that was the Starro Drive Classic right there. Where yeah, it was, it was shot wide. I could see the traffic pick up around <laughs> five o'clock. It's gritty. It's very gritty here. People people don't think that there's traffic. You know that we've had a lot of traffic here in Cambridge. No, that was that was awesome. You know, BU was having had an unbelievable year, you know, for people who don't know, BU is about a mile away from Harvard. It's right down Starro Drive. So it's the Starro Drive, the Charles River Classic. And um, it was, you know, we had 2,500 people. It was a little bit of a chilly night. They they tested out kind of overhead, you know, our, our Emery Halibi, who's our uh, production manager, did a great job of, you know, testing out some new technology. And it was a it was a back and forth game that we won 13 to nine, I think, or something like that. And so it was, uh, it was a feisty game because their fans came, our fans came and it, it was for a Tuesday night. It was, it was pretty saucy. You guys were must see TV. Honestly, at the end of the day, when, when, when I remember it, 
you lose to Yale like 17, 16 in overtime. Your Princeton game was unbelievable. The, 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 the Princeton game, you're down nine to four, I think. The, yeah. uh, the B the BU game we mentioned the Brown game was in the rain like you, you got you guys were good you guys were good exciting television yeah I mean when you have young people it could be unpredictable and you know in, in a where everyone likes predictability having a little chaos and unpredictability you know kind of brings eyeballs and you know we were we were able to lead we led the Ivy League in attendance last year as a sixth place team or fifth place team whatever we came in and so we we worked really hard to engage with our the students and and lacrosse in, in the New England community. We do a lot of free clinics and outreach and, and coaching. So as a result, I think people were a lot were excited to come watch and see what our product was. And you know, we have a bar, we have the Crimson Pub right in our stadium. So I like I didn't even know that existed because we hadn't played any games in a long time. And I'm like, we have a bar at our, our field, the Crimson. Pub, which was you know a little bit mind blowing when you think about you know Harvard and so between the Crimson Pub on one end and then we had the Crimson Club at the other where there's like beer pong tournaments going on during the game I had a hard time paying attention to what was going on in the field which probably explains the nine four deficit against Princeton so you know I think you know when you have young guys you you get a little bit of that unpredictability and they were super confident and they were unafraid to make mistakes so yeah some of those mistakes were like oh my god moments and other moments were oh my god that guy is pretty good so when you have young guys you can go either way last thing big picture defense i can't tell you how many times last year jerry that that i just want to take my pen and, and stab myself in the eye when i see defenders bad slides now costing goals like i have never seen so much defensive what's viewed as hey got to double that guy sliding to eyes sliding to non threats sliding leaving more dangerous man to go cover a guy who's not a, a you know like how do we fix that I, I my guess is it's starting at the high school level and perpetuating itself through the college game but man bad slides are creating so much offense right now well we we, we may have led the league in some games and some bad decisions so, listen I, I come out team defense from a help standpoint and you're never going to make perfect decisions and you know, to play really good team defense that has a help mentality is you're you're gonna as you're evaluating, you're gonna have some people in no man's land. You know, so that that's with the way I think about team defense, that's that's always gonna be. You're never gonna have a perfect slide sliding day and things like that. Learning how how to pull yourself out of some things is a skill that we're constantly working on. Like when to go, what are you reading that's making you go from I'm evaluating to going. That that's a constant battle when you teach help defense. So yeah, there were times where I wanted to stick my own pencil in my own eyes last year. So I don't want to throw any stones, but but I think what what where where you have like what you're touching on there is there's definitely a percentage of of the Division One coaching world which is kind of like a an own your matchup mentality, and which works until. You can't, you can't own your matchup. Match yeah. <laughs> and so now you have to go, you have to go from we're not helping or we're fake helping to we got to swing really around. Different. And and now you're playing two different defenses and you turn out to be not great at either one. I, I prefer to play one defense and try to become really good at it. And so I think a lot of times what you're talking about is we're coming into a game, we don't want to help, we want to fake adjacently, we want to fake from the crease. And then you get into the middle of a game and like, we can't guard anybody. We better start sliding. And now you don't have the nuance of the evaluative part. And as a result, you got guys in no man's land floating, staring at the dodge and no ball pressure. And I say to my guys all the time, if we have two people committed to a dodger and no ball pressure, we better hope we get a great save. Yeah. No, and, so, and so I think you understanding. No, those those are great values. Those are amazing points here. I look at it from a goalie standpoint, just because that's what comes naturally for me. You know, it's like what type of shots are we giving up? And so, right. if a guy's struggling on the perimeter, and we double, and they jam the ball to a guy at six, and he scores, I'm, I'm uh, from a goalie standpoint, I'm like, well, that that wasn't great defense. You know, if if the initial guy shot from ten or twelve, I 
probably had a better chance at it. Uh, right. How can how can folks benefit from your knowledge? Uh, Burn method, uh, Harvard. What, what, what do you got cooking we're, now in terms we're, of we're, of, you know, of all this? Uh, how can people get in touch with with your material? You know, we we put a bunch of stuff on our YouTube channel. Um, you know, uh, if you look up Harvard Lacrosse on on YouTube. So we put a bunch of uh, outreach. We started doing it during the pandemic. Like actually the next day after our season got canceled in 2020, we started doing a, a thing called One Clip, One Drill, where we took we took a clip, we ripped it apart, and then we presented a drill that could teach that, that mechanic. Um, I just did a presentation at the IMLCA. I'm doing a presentation with a bunch of the PLL guys that I, that I coached and recruited at, at Notre Dame. I'm doing something at US Lacrosse at the end of January. I, I believe for all of our guys that part of being a good lacrosse citizen is, is sharing uh, insight. I, I don't think anybody's doing anything that's that's so um, proprietary. Proprietary yeah. that, oh my God, I'm going to. And my philosophy was always give more because if they're focused on what we're trying to do, they're not focused on their team. So um, I like to give out all of our drills. So I probably have over 100 drills between the Notre Dame channel and the Harvard channel, probably different, about 100 uh, teaching drills. Of you can see of what I believe, and again, I'm not, I haven't split the atom, but I do have strong feelings on on things. Well, thanks for your time this morning. I know it's a busy time of year. You got to wrap things up. Good luck to your kids and and your your student athletes in their finals, and uh, enjoy the holidays in Boston, man. You're you're uh, you're in a great spot. Thank you. Same same to you and your family, uh, Doctor Doctor Z. You you're the man behind the magic. So. 